Hey, this is Stephanie. And I'm Nina. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to Live by the Spirit Podcast. Podcast. Yeah, we're we're changing things up this week. A little bit. We're virtual. I'm hoping maybe if you're on watching this on YouTube, you're actually physically watching us right now. I guess we're gonna find out if we can do that. <laughs> That'd be nice, honestly. <laughs> but we're both in remote 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 locations this week. Yes. Just because our schedules are a little cuckoo. Yes, very. It, we needed to get an episode done, so here we are. <laughs> yes, <laughs> recording virtually from our bed. Well, you're in your living room. I'm in my bedroom. I'm in my living room where I live. Okay, so this week we decided, well, we decided this a while ago, but this week we are going to do testimony episodes. So Stephanie is going to go first, and she's going to tear her testimony this week which is awesome so yeah i wanted nina to go first but homegirl has to always get sick i know because i because i haven't lived here for longer than 10 months i literally get every single sickness ever and i have been talking all day at work for the last two days so my voice is kind of going so steph's gonna go first i'll go next week yeah (laughs) (laughs) oh gosh do I just go ahead and start? Yeah, honestly, get into it. This is going to be like a little therapy session. I can feel it. That's okay. Um, well, <laughs> I've lived a very long life and I'm only 25. Um, <laughs> that's that's how I explain it to people. Like, But honestly, it's true. I've, I feel like now I am very appreciative for the life I've lived. But if you're talking to my dad... And my dad's telling you his, like, his version of our testimony that we share together. He'll tell you that I've lived a very challenging life. (laughs) Or, I shouldn't say that. Like, I grew up in a very loving home. But, like, I've had a lot of things happen that aren't good things. Yeah. But, I guess we'll just start from the beginning. I was born in Riverside, California. um, And to two loving, loving parents, uh, Paul and Sharon. And I grew up a very happy kid, um, was definitely a Southern California girl, Orange County through and through. I loved being outside, started swim lessons when I was like six months old. I loved being in the water. Um, we loved Disney, go to Disney like all the time. And yeah, I mean, when I look back at my younger self, like in California, I have, I'm just remembering really happy, positive memories. Um, my parents met at the church that I was like born into. Um, and so they met there, they got married there. Um, my sister met my brother-in-law there. They went to high school together at that church, um, got married there, you know, all the things. My, my oldest niece was also born into that church. Um, so it's called Bethel. Um, it's not the Bethel you know, Bethel music, not that Bethel, it's another Bethel. Um, but it was, yeah, amazing, amazing experience. I grew up going Sunday school. I mean, my dad has his pastoral, has his doctorate in judicial studies. So like I grew up a Christian kid, like technically a PK, even though my dad is never like pastored himself, but he was, you know, he travels around sometimes and ministers and he's really gifted so I feel like in a sense I grew up as a PK um and yeah so I remember giving my heart to the Lord at a very young age like I honestly could not tell you when I gave my life to Christ because it just was like it happened like I I have one specific memory that I can think of of us and it's so fuzzy but like us sitting in a corner and like one of the children's church pastors explaining it and I remember saying, I think I already did this, but I'm going to do it just in case. We've all, <laughs> we've all had I that moment. I didn't do it right. We've all yeah, had that moment. Yeah, I didn't moment. do it right. But literally could not tell you before that when, you know, when I gave my heart to the Lord. Uh, but I will say 
being young, um, I always saw in the spirit. I I don't really remember necessarily certain things. Like my dad obviously remembers more because as you get older, your memory starts to go sadly. But my dad will tell his stories of me like staring up in corners or um, seeing things. Um, we found out, I guess when I was really little and we lived in California, that we saw, I saw, I made a comment saying that I saw like a black shadow over a house and we didn't know why until years later and we found out it was the person that lived across the street from us and we found out that that guy was actually on the sex offender list and went away, I'm pretty sure he went away was not a good person and so also sorry if you hear cars I was gonna say was that outside of your apartment or my apartment (laughs) that was my apartment I'm hoping that it's not gonna affect the audio too much it's fine anyways but anyways, yeah, definitely started seeing the spirit at a pretty young age, which is really cool, um, even though I don't remember it. Um, but yeah, when I was seven years old, my dad sat me down and told me that we were going to be moving. And we'd been talking about moving for a long time. I just thought we were moving somewhere else in the Riverside, L.A. area because <laughs> we've been looking at houses like in different parts of the area. So I just assumed we we're moving down the street. But he's like, no, we're moving to Tennessee and I was so young like I hadn't done states or nothing yet I thought Tennessee was like a different country <laughs> oh my god we hadn't done states we no. hadn't done states yet in my defense we hadn't done states Stop yet like it. I didn't know I didn't know I knew California and that was it I knew California Arizona and New York because those were all where all my family oh were and that my was it gosh those were the things that I needed to know that's Anyways, hilarious. when we, we moved to Nashville when I was seven, because my dad, the Holy Spirit told my dad that he was going to start a nursing school in Nashville, Tennessee. And my dad had no prior experience in that, but that's what the Lord told him to do. And so we packed up our life, moved to Tennessee, um, and I started going to a new school, a school that I went to from second to 12th grade. So a very long time. We moved into a big house is actually b- blue and at the time one of my favorite shows was bear in the big blue house and our house was literally the big blue house i was just talking about this the other day it's crazy and my mom's dream was to live on a farm and have tons of animals and she got that dream and i had a safe neighborhood to live in which was really exciting because obviously living in california you can't just let your kids run around crazy and i remember i got to run around run outside not have my parents watch me which i don't know if people could do now but it's so different now like you need to know where everybody is and like when we were younger yeah I like remember when my parents would like be like get outside like go yeah it wasn't like that in California in California I was like stared at the whole entire time I was yeah we had a yard but but, like we played in the yard we didn't go elsewhere yeah yeah sorry but I had I had five acres that were my own were my own stage I owned those five acres you did not Uh, (laughs) Paul did. You did I, not. I, well, I owned them. I, I, that, that was. I'm not kidding. My stage. You owned I had a whole them. stage. I had my boombox outside. I was doing dances and all this, that, and then some. And yeah. So, anyways, we started going to a church out here called the River at Music City um, that my godparents um, were owned and were the pastors at. And yeah, and just through those younger years, I just remember getting really close with God. We would go to a lot of youth conferences. I was a dancer. I danced from two to about 16, 17. I quit when I was 17, I believe. Um, and my church had a dance company. And so we'd go to a lot of different like conferences and get to perform and all these different things. And one of them was Ramp um, with Karen Wheaton, which I think I briefly mentioned in another podcast. Um, but... Um, or we just talked about it recently. I can't remember, but, um, but it was there that I understood what the Holy spirit was like and how that's different from Jesus and God. And I asked the Holy spirit to come into my life and I started speaking in tongues and I was like eight or nine years old. And I remember going to school to my little Christian school with all my Baptist friends and telling them I can speak in tongues and them thinking I was crazy. (laughs) Like. And I'm thinking, they're like, what? That's that's not a real thing. Like, no. It's literally in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, it is. But some people think it's an old-fashioned thing. But, you know, so I feel like that it did a little bit. It is a spiritual of, gift. 
Yeah, I think that did a little bit of deteriorating to my confidence yeah. in my spiritual gifts. And, you know, I could see angels all the time. And then just, you know, me mentioning those to my friends who didn't understand that, telling me that it was weird, that I was seeing things like that deteriorates your conf- confidence and different things. And that's why I think when you get older, it's important to surround yourself with people who believe in the same things you do because they're going to uplift those things rather than tear them down. But anyways, um, yeah, so just kind of went about my life, was dancing, you know, trying to be a good little Christian girl. Um, and it was a like the summer before I went into – um, my freshman year of high school, I started, my mom started getting some health problems. I remember we were on a cruise to Alaska and my mom was a really active human being. And she would, um, like there's a, there's a deck that, that basically had a whole walk around the entire deck that equal to be about a mile. Um, or I think if you like went so many times equal to be a mile and every single morning she would get up and at least walk that or something. And I just remember her telling us that, like, I just can't walk my mile. It's super weird. Like, I'm in pain and my joints hurt and and different things. And we didn't think much of it because, I mean, it's just like, okay, you're getting older, like that type of thing. Um, And they went to so many doctors. Um, I believe that cruise was, like, in July. And they went to so many doctors from, like, July to August. And finally, I remember I was in – that year I was in yearbook – um, after school. And I remember my mom normally was the one who picked me up or maybe my dad. I can't remember, but I remember both of them came to the classroom after school. I was in yearbook again and they came to the classroom, picked, both picked me up and we drove in silence to the house. And I knew that they just came from an appointment and the drive was only about 10 minutes. So when you sit in like anticipation like that, it feels like an eternity. I remember we got to the house, they sat me down and they said, Mom has ALS. And I'm like, oh, praise God. I thought it was cancer because I didn't know what ALS was. No one ever taught me what ALS was in school. Like, you know, I didn't realize that it was this incurable disease that was going to take her life. Like, I didn't know that. I was like, oh, praise God. I thought she had cancer. And I just will never forget her face when I said that. Like, it was heartbreaking. And, uh, And yeah, so... How old were you? when this happened i was 15 when she got diagnosed no i was 14 about to turn 15 okay so we found out in august of 2012 no yeah i think we found out in august of, yeah found out in august of 2012 and then i was turning 15 in january of 2013 um so yeah, so that was an interesting battle to climb, but I was a faith-filled girl. I was like, the Lord is going to heal my mom. The Lord has done crazier things. Like, it didn't even occur to me that she could die because I have Jesus on my side. <laughs> and so, you know, for two years, almost two years, like walked in that faith, she progressively got worse and it it's hard to like watch someone that you care about just basically deteriorate in front of you. Um, Especially when it's somebody who normally takes care of you. And then it's like, well, it wasn't like, well, it wasn't just that it was, my mom was my best friend. And so just like all of a sudden, like watching something terrible happen, like not only to your mother, but to like your best friend. Yeah. Was really not good. I remember I remember one time she was driving me to dance class and like her just her brain, I hate like hopefully this makes sense. Her brain was slower than her actions. And so we were driving and we lived on really windy roads and all of a sudden we start going off this road and luckily like it wasn't over a cliff like in some areas and it didn't occur to her until after I started screaming and I had to take the wheel and like turn it that we were off the road just because her motor skills were like quicker than her brain. And so it, it was, I mean, I remember the day my dad had to tell her that she couldn't drive anymore. Like that was not fun. And you know, my mom was the most independent human being I've ever met in my entire life. And so to tell her that 
you have to take away her car for her freedom. It's not good. And then January of 2014, she had a scheduled like surgery to get a feeding tube put in like in a couple weeks. And it was right after Christmas. And all of a sudden, I, I will never forget this day. I woke up. I was sleeping on the couch because I couldn't sleep that night. I ended up going downstairs sleeping on the couch. I think like a lot of kids said that when they couldn't sleep. Um, and my dad woke me up. I went upstairs to go like back to bed because it was like 6 a.m. And then all of a sudden, my dad comes running in saying, get the dogs, get the cats. I just had to call an ambulance. Your mom's choking on water. Like, what? And I just sprung into action mode. So I wrangled in all the cats, wrangled all the dogs, which was not an easy task to do at 6 a.m. in the morning. you have a lot of them, too? Well, we had inside cats, and we had only a couple inside dogs. Okay. So, no, it didn't didn't take that long but um just cats are really hard to catch in general let alone um in a hurry when you're all panicked and yeah she had to get an emergency feeding tube surgery because she was choking on water and then it became apparent that she could not be left alone and my dad worked full-time i was in school and we were debating what to do for a long time and i remember school started and just the first couple days I had to miss because we didn't have anyone to watch mom. And I was, it was my second semester of my sophomore year. And, um, and yeah, so uh, it ended up, my dad ended up meeting with our headmaster, who my dad was really good friends with the headmaster of that school at the time, explained the situation. And he basically said she can do independent studies at home. Like she needs to be with her mom. And I'm forever grateful to that school for allowing me to do that. It was really hard. I had to FaceTime. Like, this was before Zoom or anything like that. So they would FaceTime me in classes and, you know, all these things. And occasionally I would have to, like, find someone in the neighborhood or a family friend to come watch my mom so I could go to school and get tutored. It was a really, like, I'm forever grateful for that semester of my life um, because it was, like, my last chance to get to spend time with her. We got to do a final cruise with her, with her, which was fun, but also devastating because again, she couldn't eat. And so we're at dinner and her watching us eat. And my mom was a big foodie. Like to me, I w- I've never been more uncomfortable in my entire life, but you know, she wanted to be there with us. She wanted to spend time with us. She was very much a quality time human being, just like myself. And then, yeah, in, on June 3rd of 2014, she passed away. And it was like one of those things like we knew it was coming. So it wasn't shocking when it happened, but it's still sad. And then my dad and I are very similar. We go into problem solving mode immediately. So my dad's like, you know, we got to do all of this. We need to go to the funeral home and schedule this and that. We need to schedule her memorial. We need to do this. We need to do that. And it's just kind of like, you know, getting all these checklists done. I remember the day after my mom passed away, you know, he wanted to go through her stuff. And I can admit I wasn't ready. I don't think my sister was ready for that, but that's what my dad needed to do. So that's what we did. Um, We ended up going to Disney for like two weeks, which was probably one of the best trips ever because it allowed us just to get away from everything and have some much needed fun because we had a very hard year. Like people don't, I think sometimes people don't realize like how difficult being with someone that sick can be. Like it's a lot of stress on you. And I was, I was only 16. Yeah. And so, yeah. All this is happening. Now, I'm sharing my testimony. So let's get back to faith. <laughs> um, I, it, it kind of was after the trip. After we got done with everything that needed to be done. And we could just be still. That I realized what had happened. And I could actually start properly mourning. And I just remember I walked out to our pasture And I screamed and I screamed at God and I said, how dare you take her away from me? How dare you do this? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You healed the blind. You healed this, that, and then some, but you couldn't cure my mom. Like you couldn't heal my mom. Like, and I was like, how dare you? Like I never said I didn't believe in God anymore, but I did not think God was just, I did not think he was a fair God. Like that didn't make any sense to me. Like, she was the sweetest human being that there ever was. Like, my rock. Like, and it's it's crazy because 
obviously she was my mom, but she was a mom to so many other people. She was a motherly figure to so many other people in our lives. And so it wasn't that she just got taken away from me as a mother. She got taken away from a lot of other people too. Obviously got taken away from my father. And I was really, really mad. And honestly, my dad was, you know, my dad was a lot older than me, but he was struggling with it too. And that's his own story to tell. But like, there was a lot of changes around the house that I wasn't used to. But we had to deal with it. And I've always loved my dad. And my dad and I were very close when I was little. But, you know, when we moved to Tennessee, like, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Like, I was in, like, so many – I was in a bunch of different dance companies. Like, I was constantly – if I wasn't in school, I was at dance. If I wasn't at dance, I was sleeping, basically. So I was always with my mom. And so my dad and I had to learn to live with each other and to just be with each other because my sister's a lot older than me. She's out of the house. Like, and so that was a whole learning curve of itself. And so I go into my junior year of high school and I am not right with Jesus. I'm not right with God. And I just kind of am going in and, you know, wanting distractions and this, you know, that and then some, I will say like, I was a pretty good kid like I didn't party I didn't do any of that like I was tempted like don't get me wrong but like I didn't do any of that like I felt very uncomfortable by that but you know I didn't really live like a very Christian lifestyle I was didn't have a good tongue you know was I I would be straight like I was a big gossiper back then you know it's stuff that I still have to deal with now um but yeah And then that year was really difficult for me, not only just from losing my mom, but I started noticing things. I had always, I've always been picked on my entire life. And like some of it's cute, funny picking on, like the things our friends do that I'm okay with. But then there's times when it crossed the line and I was realizing that I had been called dumb my entire life. And I didn't realize that until that year. I've been called blonde. I've been called dumb. I got, was called stupid. And it was just be like little things that I would say. And like, I know like sometimes I may make a stupid comment or I may make something I come, something that I say doesn't come across very intelligent, but how people portrayed me during that time, they made me feel dumb. I ended up bleaching my hair blonde. That's when I started becoming my bright blonde self, which I still, my hair is still blonde and I will probably never dye it back, but it just, that's a story for another time. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But yeah, it's just I started kind of getting a little bit more heavily bullied or if, or if anything, I became more hyper aware of it and because I was so sensitive and I ended up having an altercation that sounds, it wasn't a physical altercation. I did not like get into a fight, but there ended up being a situation with two of my best friends at the time and I became really, really depressed. I felt like I had nobody. I didn't have God. My mom's dead. I, you know, we watched the commercials, like the depression commercials. And it's like, you'd see these people who have this loving family around them, but they don't want to move. They don't want to get out of bed. And I never understood that. I'm like, girl, literally get up. Like, you're fine. (laughs) Until, until I got depressed for the first time. And it's, the weirdest feeling you'll be in bed you won't want to watch anything you won't want to do anything and you just lay there and you go to sleep you wake up you just lay there and you know my luckily my dad noticed and it wasn't like he he knew it wasn't me just not wanting to go to school he knew that there was other things going on but like I've never like I never felt that way before and so we had to figure out what was the cause issues and when it ended up being all this bullying and obviously my mom dying and a different, a bunch of different things. I also started getting very high anxiety. I had my first panic attack ever during my first history test my junior year. What a great And time. it was because, it was because this teacher decided I'd been prepping for weeks for this test because I heard she was a very difficult teacher. I've been prepping for weeks for this test. I go and take the test and then she's like, Mind you, I think we only had 50 minutes of class. And she was like, so I realized I didn't lecture on the last chapter. So I'm going to lecture for 20 minutes and then you can take the test the rest of the time. That is 20 minutes of my 15 minutes to take your test. That is not okay. And I had a full on panic attack and I thought I was dying. And that was fun to have to deal with. And so, yeah. And so I'm just, I mean, 
that's when the enemy really started playing with me was when I was upset with God. I didn't really get back in a good graces with God for a really long time. And like I said earlier, I knew God was real. I just didn't think he was just. And we weren't going to church during that time. My church that I'd grown up going to had closed um, just due to financial things. My dad started going to a church and was kind of forcing me to go. And I hate, like, this sounds awful. And if anyone's from that church is listening, it's nothing against them. But I hated going to that church. I think it was the wrong place at the wrong time. And yeah, and then senior year hit and I started getting all these college sending me all this stuff. And I remember I got this huge magazine in the mail. Like, I don't know if your brother got one of these things, but it was this giant magazine. It was like probably like my torso length, I don't know, probably even longer than that. It was a huge magazine and it was from all of it. And I was looking through it. Like I was looking through all these college things because it was pretty clear I was going to go to college in like in-state junior college for the time being just because that's all we could afford and I'm looking through this college and I felt the Lord tell me it was the first time I heard God's voice in a really long time saying this is where you're going you belong here which all of its tagline is you we belong, believe you belong we here believe you belong here and so I was like okay I don't think he got one of those but that's awesome yeah I was like okay I will apply and I applied and I got in. And actually, I got into every school I applied to. So back to those dumb comments. They weren't right. No, no, no. <laughs> but, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, I knew that I was eventually going to re- reconcile with God. Like I knew that that was going to happen. I just needed time. You know, it's kind of like when you're mad at like a friend and you need space from them. It was like that. Like, you know, you're going to get back and it's going to be fine, but you just need space. I just needed that. I ended up getting accepted to all of that. And all of that ended up being cheaper for me to go to than going to my private school, which is ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, started going to all of that. And through all of that, you know, started healing started meeting some really good people. I remember I worked at Wind Shape Camps one summer, which is owned by Chick-fil-A. Got Chick-fil-A every single week. It was glorious. I'm uh, jealous. Now I eat it every day, so it's like, what? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I remember sitting there, and it was the first time I'd really gone through the Word of God in a really long time because I had to be talking to my campers about God and, you know, walking them through, you know, do you want Jesus Christ to come into your life and all these things. And I really did a lot of healing during that time and, you know, started becoming more active in, in the word of, of God. But I still let the enemy creep into my head because I didn't know any better. And I think when you're young and you're a Christian, you don't know how to fight the enemy as well as you do when you get older. And there's, you know, you have to go through these processes, basically. So I started healing a lot more. And junior year of college hits every single junior year I have ever had. I get depressed, got depressed my junior year of college, got out of that. The Lord helped me out of that, um, had a great senior year for the most part. And then COVID happened. I had been praying. Yep. Like most stories I had been praying for years to be able to work at Disney because as I said earlier, we're big Disney people went on. Went to Disneyland all the time, went to Disney Cruises, went to Disney World, and I had gotten into the Disney College program. That was, like, my first step in. And I just, a lot of things kept happening that made me, like, confirm this was God's plan. Kathy, my stepmom, encouraged me to write a letter to Bob Iger, who, if you don't know, is the CEO of Disney, basically, like, telling him, you know, my life story, how much I love Disney, how I want to work for the company, and all these things. Sent it to Bob Iger. Like, a couple weeks later, get an call from a Disney recruiter saying that she wanted to chat with me from the letter that I sent Bob Iger. I'm like, what the frick? And so I ended up getting connected with this recruiter who's telling her like my goals in life. And she basically was like, we're going to come up with a plan for you. Like we want people like you to work at this company. So the first thing you got to do is do the Disney college program, get your foot in the door. And then, you know, once you get down here, we're going to help set you up with these networking events. And she's like, I really do believe we can get you know, your dreams are fulfilled. And so, like, tell me that that does not seem like God right there. You love Kathy. What? Like, like, that was, we love Kathy, but, like, that recruiter, That's like, I was so like, they're, cool, they're, though. that that made me think, like, oh, my gosh, this is God. Like, I'm going to work at Disney. My dreams are coming yeah, true. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. all these things. 
Well, I get into the college program. I not just get into the college program. I get the role I want. And the way, if you've ever applied to this college program or ever had a friend do it, they do it in waves. So there's like a really big first wave and like a lot of people get accepted second wave, third wave. I, it was me and like four other people got accepted before the first wave. We got accepted on a Friday, the Friday before my birthday. So January 25th, 2020, my birthday's January 26th, got accepted that day. And then Kaylee, uh, one of our friends, got accepted on Monday, which that was during the first big wave. So I not only got the role I wanted accepted, I got told before a, like everybody basically that I'd gotten it. That's so that so means crazy. I was one of their first... That means I was one of their first choices, which is huge. Yeah. Another God thing. Tell me. Tell me I'm wrong. Anyways, COVID happens. It's funny enough. I'm at Disney World when I find out we're not going back to school. Like, what a coincidence. Um, Was was devastated, of course. But I'm like, hey, I got Disney. We'll go back for graduation. It's fine. Graduation gets canceled. It's okay. I'm going to Disney in a couple weeks. Everything's good. I'll never forget. It was a Monday. I made a TikTok of me dancing. (laughs) Sounds so stupid. I was in a really good mood that day. I'm a savage. Yeah, I literally knew you were going to say that. (laughs) That was the trend then. Um, But anyways, I I was in a really – I just remember I got up really early. I did my makeup. I did that dance. I had already got done with my classes that day. I was in the best mood ever. And Kaylee texted me. She – with a lot of crying stuff saying did you read the email i'm so so sad like how why is this happening and i'm like no this is not happening right now and sure enough check my email and they cancel the program and the first thing out of my mouth was why god why did you do this why are you doing this to me and i instantly stopped myself and i was like you've worked so hard to get back in good graces with god or get that relationship strong enough. And that's your first reaction is to blame God. That that showed me that I hadn't done a lot of healing. And I, ended up, I stopped. I said, sorry, God. Not your fault. This is not your fault. But then I called my dad. Hysterically crying. And all I kept saying was, my life is over. Because I truly felt like I had no purpose. I was not going back to school. I had to move back home. I had no friends out here. I had two friends from high school. And that was about it. I cut all ties with everyone else uh and so all your plans i felt like i had, had for after college yeah and i thought this was a god thing i'm like yo i, I was like i was so confused and i was like this doesn't make sense like it didn't make sense and i felt immediately so lonely i like i like literally saw my life flash before my eyes i thought i was going to move to disney i was going to have this great career i was going to find my husband Like, I'd already, I'd already basically been, like, church hopping virtually. Like, I picked the church I wanted to go to, had been, like, looking at their small groups, like, was talking with people from this church. Like, I was, like, fully ready for that move. Like, I was so ready. And then for it to just come crashing down, it didn't make sense to me at all. And so the decision, you know, then I had to decide, what am I going to do? Am I just going to move down to Florida, find a job in Florida, and just wait for the college program to get started? What? what are options here? And so I ended up, I, I, first and foremost, I graduated, which is a good thing to happen. But then I started applying to marketing jobs because that's what I studied in school and nothing was clicking and didn't make any sense to me. And I had to go back to retail and I worked in retail all throughout high school and in college, hated it. And so I ended up having to get this retail job where I got verbally harassed basically every single day from my boss, um, like bullied. I met my, I met some of my, I met some friends out of that. Like my friend Kogan, for instance, I met out of that. So that was the only good thing out of that situation. And I just remember I'd been working there for three months. I think it was like August or something. And I finally, I cracked. I had one of my friends who I was working with came up to me and she was like, just let you know, we're going to have, a, like, they're forcing me to have a conversation with you tomorrow, the, like, managers. Mind you, we're both key holders, me and this girl. They're making us have this conversation about uh, how we can't be friends anymore. And she basically said what they told me was they see me being, like, management material. They don't see you doing, amounting to anything in your life. 
what? And, and she told me that because she was my, she is, still is my friend, but she was like, I'm telling you this because that's not true. And like, I just wanted to prepare you for tomorrow. I didn't want you to be blindsided because what I have to say to you tomorrow is not what I believe. It was because they were forcing her to say it. I that is lost ridiculous. it. I snapped. I snapped. I started hysterically crying. I told my dad. I was like, because what my deal with my dad was, it's either like I had to have a job to stay in the house for free. I said, I can't be here. I can't be here anymore. This is torture. This is not fun for me anymore. And finally, we came to an agreement. It's like, you can quit, but you have to find a job within the month or you have to start. You need, need to figure, you know, you have to move out or something. And so thank God I quit. And I will say with that job, I had to work Sundays. I couldn't, I never got a Sunday off. And during that time is when my parents started going to our current church. And so I quit the job and I start going to our church, Eastgate, regularly. Yeah. Heck yeah. And, and that, like everything happens for a reason. And all of a sudden I started healing, spiritually healing. And I started meeting people my age who believe the same things that I do. And it's so true that being around people who believe, like, you become who you surround yourself with. And it's really true. Being around, being around our current friends, I wanted to grow more with God. I wanted to have a personal relationship with God. I wanted to get my spiritual gifts back. And I started healing. And our, uh, our, one of our pastors, Pastor Laura, she tells the story like every so often. She told it at Outpour again the other day. So it makes me think it was a very impactful moment for the both of us. But um, I went up to the front and I was crying and she was praying over me and everything. And she told me, she's like, God's telling you to lean over. So I like leaned over and she like, she's like, you have like a root that God's telling me that I need to pull out of your stomach. I was like, okay, I've heard crazier things. And I remember, sh- like, mind you, all this is like, there's not actually like a root there. It's all spiritual in the <laughs> spirit. Um, but when she pulled this root out, I wailed. I felt this thing come out of me. And, and she told me that that, roof, that root in me was grief. I was still grieving. And I just pressed it so far down. And from that day on, I felt lighter and I haven't, I, I hate, you, you're going to mourn every single day of your life if you lose someone that you truly love. Um, like, don't let anyone tell you differently. My favorite saying is, you'll never move on, but you can move forward. Mm-hmm. And I had been p- pulling myself back. Like, I remember times when I'd come home from college, I'd be driving home and I would just, be dwelling and be like, I miss my mom. She's no longer here. She won't be here for graduation. She won't be here for my wedding. And then I get depressed because I sat in that sadness. My dad would get so mad at me. And I never understood that until that moment. And so we did a bunch of, we did a bunch of healing. And then January of 2021, I get, I was still working retail. It was a different job though, much better job. And I get the email saying that, we can reapply for the college program, Disney college program. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do because I just connected it in a church. I'm starting to do all the spiritual growth, but might as well reapply. Kaylee and I were going to Disney the next week. I was like, never hurts. Went to Disney, got back. I think it was the day after we got back. I get the email saying that I got accepted and I knew instantly I heard the Lord tell me you are not going you are not going and it was like finally that I'd been waiting for it because they had told us when the program got canceled that like it would come back and we'd have a chance to reapply for it um even if we're not in college anymore and I'd been waiting for that for months for actually probably over a year at that point and I was like what but I didn't feel sadness I was like, okay, I, I felt fine. I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything. I remember having to tell Kaylee that and Kaylee was sad because the whole entire time we planned to do it together, but she went and had a phenomenal time. That's where she was meant to go. But then that end of June, I was supposed to move in like early June, end of June, I got rebaptized. 
And it was really like I had so much growth during that time of life. And even like this past year, 2022, like it's crazy. Like it's only been three years since the pandemic. And I feel like I've grown so much more in my life than ever in three years. And I'm 25. I remember we had a when you posted your baptism photos on Instagram. I remember that. Yeah. Weird memory that I have. But I remember that. And did you think you were going to be at that church? No. I also (laughs) had no clue I was going to be in Nashville. So not the plan at the time. (laughs) Story for another time. Very much so. Next week. Anyway. Next week. Uh, Anyways. Anyways, yeah, I got rebaptized. And then, um, yeah, and then I was at a new job. I just got a new marketing job. It's my first ever, like, full-time marketing job. That job. Uh, that company went under two months after I started, so I was back to being unemployed. Um, ended up getting another job. Had that job for a little over a year. Um, got let go from that job in October of 2022. That was not good. And then was unemployed for four months. And but but I will say it's crazy. Both the times that I got like like well the first time the company went under. The second time I got let go, both times I felt such peace because I knew that God had a plan for me. And if I just worked at it, if I applied, if I did what I needed to do, that God was going to help get me to where I needed to get. And he did. And it's crazy. Probably the thing that's changed me, I will say a big thing that's changed me. And I want, if you're listening to this and you deal heavily with depression and anxiety, you know, look up this guy, Pastor Eddie Turner. Pastor Eddie Turner came and taught at our church Eastgate on a outpour, which every the the first Wednesday of every month we have an outpour service. Um, instead of having church every single Wednesday, we only have it the first Wednesday of the month. And he came and spoke. And he has a really amazing book. I forgot the title Conquering of it. Conquering the really Chaos of me. Your Mind. Yeah. So if you haven't had a chance to ever hear him speak, get this book, read it. It's insane. If you deal with depression and anxiety, you will thank me later. Um, he came and started speaking and he was telling us a story about, about basically how he was super depressed. He never wanted to leave his house, how he had crippling anxiety and how the Lord freed him of it. And I start crying as he's telling me the story because I have dealt with severe, severe depression and anxiety since I lost my mom and it comes in waves. And during that time of life, I just so happened to be extremely anxious and I had been having panic attacks more often. And if you have ever had a panic attack, it's the worst feeling in the world. You feel like you're dying. And there was a point in my life, like in high school and college, where I'd have like probably two panic attacks a month. And I will say I had a panic attack last week. But before that, I couldn't have told you when the last time I had a panic attack was. (laughs) In my defense, I was about to say it was a worthwhile panic attack. It wasn't, but I was a very stressful situation and I couldn't. Yeah. Anyways, story for another time. But basically he would, this is, this is what Eddie said. And it's going to sound so simple. And some of you are not going to believe me that it's this easy because I did not believe this man when he said it was that easy, but it so is when you get a thought from the enemy, like I'm trying to think of one for instance, like you're dumb. Um, you're a fa- you're dumb you're a failure when you that instant that thought comes into your head instead of sitting there and letting it fester and like being like am i dumb like like feeding into that stop what you're doing and praise the lord so when so like i said earlier my whole entire life because people had said this to me i believed that i was dumb because people had proclaimed that over me so and it's i still get triggered like we had a conversation not too long ago with some of our guy friends when we were just talking about things. And, you know, I told the story about how I got bullied. And, you know, we could probably do a whole separate story on that. My, my testimony is just so long that I didn't want to have to rely heavily on that one part of it. But I, um, you know, for me, that thought of, oh my gosh, did, did I just say something dumb? That's like what the enemy said. You just made a dumb comment. And I'm like, crap. I'm such a dumb person. Why did I say that? Like, oh my gosh, that's entertaining a thought. So it's like when the enemy says you made a dumb comment, 
I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for the blood. <laughs> Literally. God, you are so good. Thank you, God. I love you. Da, 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 da. It's almost like, I'm trying to think of it like when, like, I'm sure all of us have had a moment where, like, our parents come into our room to tell us to do something and we, like, pretend like we're not listening and we have music, like, head our headphones are going to music or playing. And we're just, like, not listening to them and, like, blocking them out. That's literally what you have to do with the enemy. And it's so easy. And he says this, and I'm like, what? And I remember our friend Jude, who we mentioned a few times, he was sitting, I believe, to the left of me. And I look at him, and I said, no. I, said, I literally flat out said, no way it's that easy. No way it's that easy. And, and I was just like, oh, my gosh. And my life changed. My life changed for ever by him saying that and you know what's so funny is everything that eddie started saying i started realizing this is what my father has been preaching to me <laughs> since i was 16 <laughs> funny my how father that has... way how like your parents can tell you something over and over again and then it takes one other person to tell you and you listen and it like hits but but my, my dad my dad and i've told this story a ton of times uh it Sometimes you you have to, it's the right time and it has to be the right person. Yeah, I agree. Because during that time of my life, I was not ready to listen. I wasn't ready. And you know, it's, I've had, I've, I've talked to a few of my friends who aren't in this friend group, but in other areas, and they're going through similar things that I've gone through and I'm preaching to them everything I just said about what Eddie said, and I can tell they're not ready to hear it right now. I'm going to keep telling them that. I'm going to be my dad. I'm going to be annoying. I'm going to keep telling them. But it's so easy. But they have to get to that right spot. And for me, I had to get right with God. I had to start building my relationship with God to realize that it's that easy. Because God's done, like I said earlier, God's done crazier things. Yeah. And so, and so yeah, if you have a chance, please buy the book. Because um, it goes into his story more that he told to us and just crazy he gives some other tips and tricks in there but but yeah and so i live a way less anxiety induced life it actually irritates me now when people tell me that they're anxious about something poor nina the amount of times she's told me that she's anxious about something i'm literally like girl you I know remember the, tools. the first time right after eddie spoke and i it was literally the next day and I, like, texted you and Jude. I was like, I'm super anxious about this flight. My anxiety. And you're like, no, do not claim that anxiety as your own. But also, yep. one to say. Every time you have a flight. <laughs> one to say, I think it is crazy how Eddie spoke exactly two weeks before you lost your job. Exactly yep. two weeks. And you know what's so crazy is... The night before I lost my job, I got an email from my, like, boss boss, like, the VP of marketing at this job, saying that we needed to meet with the head of HR. And mind you guys, this is out of the blue. In the state of Tennessee, they do not need to give you a, like, in some jobs, like, in some states, they need to, you need to have a certain amount of notices, so they need to have a conversation with you. The state of Tennessee, you don't need any notice. You don't need any reason as to why you are being let go. You, you can just be simply let go. And so I had not, no one had told me nothing. Like I, and I thought with this company that we had formed really good relationships and that if I was making mistakes or if there was issues that they would sit me down and talk it through with me and they didn't do that. And I just remember I got that email and something did not sit right. And I was extremely anxious all night. And I even texted you as a joke. Worst case, I get fired. Literally, I will never forget that you said that because the next day when you told me, I was like, she's joking. There's absolutely no way. Because you had made that comment the night before and we were like, like you said, you know, you thought that if there was a problem, they would sit you down and tell you and like, you know, correct your performance because working is all about constructive criticism. So when you told me that, I was like, you're kidding. Uh, Yeah. And I remember I got there. My, my meeting was the first thing that morning. I literally had worship music in my AirPods from the time I left my apartment, which I know you're not supposed to drive with AirPods in, but I needed, like, in my ear. 
because I was like remembering what Eddie told me you need to be praising God and I was so anxious I was in the midst of about to have a panic attack go in get let go walk out about to start crying text text you guys because you guys you and Jude in particular were waiting I just texted you guys that was fired grabbed my stuff from my office got in my car waited until I got off property and then started crying (laughs) but immediately but here's growth here's growth everybody immediately I got into my car and started crying and I started praising God what did I just say not too long ago when I found the college program didn't happen when my mom died I blamed God Mm -hmm. and that was the moment for me that I knew that I have done so much growth because I could have really easily sat there and be like why did you do this why Lord like I don't understand like, I'm going to be unemployed. Like, I live by myself. I don't have anyone else to help me with rent. Like, what What the heck? But no, I praised God. And I started feeling an overwhelming sense of peace. I knew that I was going to be taken care of. I knew I was going to be fine. Of course, I was devastated. I'm not going to lie. I was scared. Like, we have fear for a reason. But, like, that was my instant growth. And so praise the Lord that Eddie Turner came when he did. And I needed to get that, that lesson in Literally, me when I did. Yeah. But... Yeah, I had an overwhelming peace during those four months. And it's like crazy. I'd be talking with people and they're like, how are you not freaking out? Like your rent is, you're about to have to let them know about your apartment in like two weeks. And I'm like, I still two more weeks to get a job. I remember <laughs> like say, like thinking this whole time and even like looking back, you had literally peace. And in Philippians 4, 7, it says peace that surpasses all understanding. And you literally had mm-hmm. that because there's no way yep. that we can understand why things like that happen, especially when they don't give you a reason or it's out of the blue like that. We don't know, but yeah, I remember what Jillian said to you is that, you know, God was taking you out of that situation for a reason and that there was something going mm-hmm. on that you didn't need to be a part of. Yeah, which it's funny enough, I'd been feeling that summer, so I got let go in October. I'd been feeling that summer that I needed to get find a new job, and now I know that was the Holy Spirit. I thought I didn't like not gonna lie it was technically a nonprofit, wasn't making a ton of money um, but I loved the people I worked with so I was like I loved my job I actually loved what I did so to me I was like I'm good now looking back when that all that happened God said you need to listen to me you were in your Jonah moment of life right now not Jonah your brother but Jonah <laughs> Like, I was, like, I, the Lord had to physically remove me from that situation. Not saying that what's happening there is not good. I believe that place is still good. I still love everyone I worked worked with then. Even, like, the woman who fired me. I, she taught me so much. I appreciate her. If I saw her walking down the street, I'd give her a big hug. Like, I have nothing but love. But I had to, I didn't listen to God. And so I had my Jonah whale moment. And I was in the whale, or not whale, big fish. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but had that moment. But for me, the the thing that got me through that obviously was God. But like James one was the chapter for me because it talks about trusting God in trials and how God tested tests you when you're in trials. God is our Father, and our parents test us sometimes, and our Heavenly Father tests us a lot just to make sure that we are staying true to Him. And so one of my tests was how I was going to react to that situation. And I corrected well. I praised the Lord and everything. So I was healing and different things like that. But just really, you know, James 1. And then actually my, um, like, I feel like testimonial verse for that time of my life is James 1.12. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, you know, it's even crazier. I ended up get George, our friend Georgie, about a month before I got a job. Uh, so spoiler, alert, not unemployed anymore. But anyways, <laughs> uh, Georgie had a dream, and she said she heard my voice tell her I got the job just in time. And she heard it so clearly, she thought that I'd actually called her in the morning and told her that. So I went over there later that day to do stuff with her and we, she started talking to me as if I got a job and I was like I haven't got a job yet she's like oh yeah that's right it's a dream and she said she heard my voice say that well funny enough I got the job on a Tuesday I had to let them know on Wednesday if I was staying in my apartment complex I had bills due that next that Thursday 
that I wasn't sure, like, I had enough money to cover it, but, like, it was going to be the last of my savings. Like, I was at, I was at the finish line right there. Like, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. And the Lord, like, I, and I, the best call I made that day was to Georgie when I called her and I said, I got the job just in time. Like, that felt amazing. Now, with that being said, I have realized I've enjoyed my time at this current job. I prayed. I'd been praying for the right job, but those last couple of weeks, I was like, Lord, I need a job for right now. I need a job for right now. And the Lord provided that, but it wasn't the right job for me necessarily. So I'm currently, I'm actually my last week at this place. I'd only been there about two months. Um, and I'm about to start a new job on Monday uh, that I felt the Lord calling me to and end up working out. And that's, again, probably story for another time. We're almost at an hour here. <laughs> I've, like I said earlier, I've lived a lot of life and I'm only 25. Yeah. So, and I quickly rush through everything. Um, I would love for us to do an episode about bullying in school and stuff. And I feel like both of us mm -hmm. can tell stories and, you know, how that impacted us spiritually and different things like that. But, but yeah, I think for me, a, I've learned a lot in my life. I've learned what it means to mourn. I've learned what loss feels like. Um, I've learned what it feels like to have people stomp on you, to be teared down, um, to let the enemy win. And those things aren't good. Some of those things we can't control. I can't control, you know, this is flesh. Like you can't, unless you're watching the video, I am flesh. Like this is flesh. My spirit will last forever because I have the Holy Spirit in me, but like my body this is going to die one day. It's like already in a sense, every day we live, it's closer to dying, mm -hmm. which is sad, you know, cause our brains, we live like we think flesh, you know, and that to me, it's like, Oh no, one day I'm not going to be here. Like that, that's not a good feeling, but I'm like, at the same time, it's like, I know I'm going to go to a much better place and like heaven and God and all that. Then like, praise God, you have to be my mom again, like all those fun things. But but yeah, now I can't even remember where I was going with that. I got off on a tangent. I don't remember <laughs> either. I think you were just recapping. I don't. Yeah, but I, th I think the the thing is, is like the earthly things aren't going to matter. Yeah. In the long run, and and to me, that's the thing that when kids, in particular, kids in high school or even middle school, are like getting so depressed that they're considering ending their life. Like I'm going to let you know this, like. I understand. I've been there. It gets better. Like, it really, I know people say that. It does. High school is four years of your life. It is four years of your life. People are mean. And the thing I've learned through all of this is that it is not that that person is not an evil person. That person has evilness speaking through them. That is Satan talking through that person to you. And the sooner that you start forming a close relationship with God and growing with him, the easier it is going to be able to block them out. Literally do like we said with like having the headphones on. You're going to have your like Christ you're going to have your godly headphones on praising God. And it's just like the soon and it's just like I want young kids to realize this when they're really young. And like that's something that I hope with all the kids at our church like I can preach to them and stuff and like I, I know a majority of them are gonna be homeschooled and not go to like a full-on high school like I did like you did yeah <laughs> but like you know it's still the true it's still true and so it just breaks my heart every time I hear about a kid hurting themselves or you know actually going through with it it's like you have so you don't know what yeah. else is out there and you're letting in that moment you let the enemy win yeah and you know we we had an individual in our life recently struggle with this and that's what I said to this person. I said, I am proud that you are sharing this with us because you know that this is the next step to get you out of that depressed state and you're not letting the enemy win because if you were to do this, you're letting the enemy win. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. But anyways, I wanted, that's my tangent. I wanted to share <laughs> two verses that were on topic with what you were talking about. Obviously, the first one being 2 Corinthians 10, 5, which is the soul, you know, verse mm -hmm. that Eddie Turner talks about, and it's taking mm -hmm. every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. Yep. 
So that is, you know, the essence of what he teaches you is he's teaching you how to do that because it, you think about it, you're like, how do I do that? But like you said, take that thought and praise God. You don't need it. You don't need to give life to that thought. It's the easiest thing you can do. Mm -hmm. It's the easiest thing you can do. Yeah. Like. Literally. (laughs) It's crazy. I was thinking about, I was thinking about this earlier today. This is kind of off subject, but. Do you remember when you learned how to drive, how stressful it was when you were behind the wheel and there's other cars going around and you're trying to remember all the rules and now we drive like it's second nature. Like there's sometimes, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this is a good thing, but there are sometimes I drive home and I'm like, I, all of a sudden I'm pulling into my apartment complex and I'm like, I don't remember doing any of those turns because I was just daydreaming. That's not good, but it became, it became second nature at a point. You got an autopilot. This is... You go on autopilot. This is the same thing. You, you know, if you're living in anxiety and stuff like this, it's going to be difficult when you first start doing it. And like, I will admit when I, you know, when Eddie first started talking about that and I started dealing like heavily with, I was dealing with heavily anxiety. I could tell you that that night before I went, I let, got let go. I just sat in anxiety and I tried everything. I just, I could not get out of being anxious but because i sat there and listened to worship music and just spent time with god even though i was still anxious i did not get myself into a panic even though i could feel like my heart pounding all that i i knew i was okay like and now i've gotten to a point and again it's like seasons of life are going to come it's going to be more harder than others but i'm almost like an autopilot like i know when those thoughts come that i can quickly like praise god and they're gone and now I can feel confident when I have a friend like you or whoever mm-hmm. who are telling me, who are like, this is, I'm stressed about this. Yeah. Uh, and like I said earlier, it drives me crazy. I'm like, yeah. you know, you know, like, like, I think the last time you flew, you were like, pray that the storm doesn't well, come. Well, and that's, that was different flight. circumstances because there was a literal hail yeah. and thunder, severe thunderstorm. But, different i wasn't but i told you i wasn't anxious I told about you. the flight i was nervous about not making my connecting flight yeah that was the thing. i was like girl tr- i literally but i said girl trust god nothing's oh, yeah. happened yet your flight's gotten a little delayed but you're good and guess what you got home fine i did i did and so and i have to preach that to myself sometimes and sometimes i reap what i sow because then i start getting anxious and then freaking nina's over here like telling me what to do and i'm like girl <laughs> Hey, sometimes we need that friendly <laughs> reminder, even though we don't want to hear it. We need to hear it sometimes. I know. Yeah. The, whenever, wait, what were you going to say? Sorry. Nothing. I was just like, whenever you do that, it drives me crazy because <laughs> I know it's right, but I don't want it. It's right? one of those moments where I don't want to hear it, and I just want to sit there for a second. Just like, let me deal with this Let right me now. just wallow in my sadness. <laughs> let me just wallow. <laughs> <laughs> Which I literally just went on preaching about is not good. Literally, We all do it sometimes, but. The second verse that I wanted to share is Colossians 3, 2, which is set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And that, what you were talking about before, like, this is flesh. Like, it's four years of your life. It's the one day of mm-hmm. your life. Put your mind on where you're going, where you're headed. What is your mindset? Mm-hmm. We are kingdom followers. We serve the kingdom of God. We need to continue that out from day to day and it's so easy when we remember God is my end goal. His kingdom is my end mm-hmm. goal, not what is happening to me right now, which is hard, but well, it's hard. I mean, we, yeah. we, we are of the world. We can't help that. We are of the we world. We are in the world. We like, are not of the world. Yeah. But you know, our flesh is, yes, that is true. And, and, um, we just have to remember that we need to have our spirit outweigh our flesh. And that can be hard. That can be hard. Cause our, our flesh is, likes to have a nice fight with our spirit it you know it, it sounds stupid but it's the best visualization whenever you see a cartoon like our version of this is from emperor's new groove but my dad's like it's been that going on for years with cronk movies. with cronk with the devil and the angel oh like that's the first time i ever saw that it's like obviously it's been in a lot of other things not just yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. was the first time i ever saw that I made a comment to my dad not too long ago about that. And, like, I knew it was from other things, but I just mentioned that was the first time I'd ever seen it. my dad's like, oh, my gosh. I remember being a kid and watching this, and it was on that. Like, <laughs> that's not the first thing it was on. I was like, I know that, Father. I'm just saying that this was the first time I saw it. But it's so true. We have our spirit 
telling us one thing and our and our flesh the enemy telling us the other and it's a constant spiritual warf warfare in our head it's constant and so it's just you know letting letting the angel who's sitting on your shoulder like letting your spirit win you're trying your best and again we're human we're gonna fail god knows that he still loves mm -hmm. us like he's not gonna you know um so i know this is long my last visualization which mm -hmm. i think i might have mentioned in another podcast or or something one of my favorite stories to teach to young kids is and i taught this to my campers when i worked at that camp was peter walking on the water because you know peter got on the water and he was walking towards jesus because he was locked eyes with jesus the second he looked away that's when he started drowning and then the second that peter said help me lord help me don't let me die it says in the word of god immediately jesus pulled him up immediately it didn't say well you took your eyes off me so i'm gonna let you sit there and drown for a little bit and let you you know think about your mistakes no immediately he pulled him up because that's how loving our father is that's how loving jesus christ is so there's gonna be times when things happen and you may take your eyes off god or you aren't spending as much time with god and you're noticing that you get anxious more easily or or even like i'm gonna flat i'd say it you may turn away from god at one point in your life it i i did that in a way you know i i know a lot of people who that happens to and even like you know i've seen situations of people that are around us who start doing it it's sad but God, but the second you ask God for help, he's going to come and immediately pull you up. And so that's the biggest takeaway that I, if, from my testimony that, and I think that's one, why that's one of my favorite Bible like stories is because the amount of times that I've pulled away and God immediately has pulled me up. So yeah. Anyways, that's my life. <laughs> what is that quote from Lizzie I'm glad, McGuire? Uh, that's like what I was about to say. I'm oh wait. Well, that's my life. I, I'm hoy. I literally you made it one of my captions yeah. the other day. Of course, my internet's not loading. Well, that's my life. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I hope you enjoyed it because I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, when I first read that, I heard it in Hillary Duff's voice. Yeah. Well, that's my life. <laughs> also, this is so off. But really quickly, before we end this, we have to take the B reel that went off. <laughs> Everyone, do your V-Reels. It's fun. Ready, Nina? Oh, my gosh. Wait, I need to redo mine. Oh, my gosh. My it's messy like room is in the background. My face. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> These poor people are like, what's going on? Hopefully Nina edited some of this out and it's not <laughs> not just dead silence of us trying to do things. Oh my gosh. Nina, you're going to have to edit this out. My phone is not working anymore. Honestly, yeah, probably. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> we just took a B-reel break. A B-reel break. It was like yes. less than a minute, so it's fine. Anyways. Yeah, we only have two minutes to post, so anyways thanks so much for joining us we hope you enjoyed yes. it because i know i did <laughs> <laughs> anyways make sure to come in next to come in make sure to tune in next week because we're going to do nina's testimony we were i wanted nina to go first because i i am like my father i'm a i have a commanding voice and sometimes i talk too much in these podcasts and i don't let nina's voice be heard and so I wanted okay. her to go first, <laughs> but she's not feeling good. And so she was like, I don't want to talk for long periods of time today. And I was like, well, I can get us talking. I could talk for hours by myself. But we anyway, it. so so make sure you tune in next week for that. We have some exciting things coming up. We started writing on our schedule. So I'm very excited to see what will come of that. Me too. We may hopefully have a couple guests coming on here soon. Um, still trying to figure that all out logistically, but yeah. Yeah. 
anyways should be great see you next week we'll see you next week yeah should be great <laughs> okay bye bye <laughs>